our great friend and uh, member, Dan Matthews, uh, as you all know, from People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. But I'm going to come on up, Dan. Bring this tall drink of water up here and sit you down. Um, but I'm going to read you the one, the one thing that um, <laughs> Lily Tomlin has now said about his book, Committed, a Rabble Rouser's Memoir. And Lily Tomlin writes, it's smart, silly, and downright readable with unstoppable spirit, like David Sedaris, but with a mission. So there you go. Take it away, Dan. Thanks. I, I like the quote that Tommy Lee gave, which was, if you read one book this year, like me, <laughs> uh, anyhow, I've been with PETA uh, 22 years, but I always uh, did writing as a moonlighting job to help make ends meet. Going back to, uh, you know, 20 odd years ago for awful poems for punk magazines, and some of it relates to my work. Um, I've been arrested so many times in protests that I wrote a connoisseur's guide to the world's jails for details, in which I rated each jail for food, hospitality, accommodation. <laughs> Don't get arrested in Chicago. They do not let you primp before your mug shot. Um, but I've also written about other experiences and other obsessions. I wrote a tribute piece about Lawrence Welk for TV Guide and about the opening weekend of Dollywood uh, for Out. Um, so I always did these little odd uh, freelance jobs, and it, uh, I actually have my, uh, my book deal uh, to have to thank San Diego. Uh, odd uh, circumstance led me to uh, here and to my book deal. I um, had a big, huge pita gala in LA, and I'm not an LA person. Three or four days I have to get out. So I had to escape Los Angeles, and I wanted to go to a place where I didn't know anybody and that nobody I worked with and nobody knew who I was. So I decided to come to San Diego and it was right in the wake of the Kunanan uh, controversy. So I thought, I need to adapt somebody else's image and uh, I name and where they live. I can't be an animal activist. The only person I knew of from San Diego was Andrew Kunan. And so I saw in Vanity Fair, I said he uh, hung out at Flick's video bar, lived on California Street, all this stuff. So I thought, that's easy. I'll just say, my name's Andrew and I'm a drifter between jobs. <laughs> it really was like a nice holiday for the weekend. Nobody asked me about being vegetarian or anything like that. Well, I get back to Los Angeles on Monday and um, Genre Magazine called and they, had, they included me in their list of influential gays uh, for their uh, millennium issue. And they asked who I considered an influential gay of our times. And I just, without thinking, said, oh, Andrew Cunanan, because he got the size of his package in fur. <laughs> well, uh, the day that came out, they got besieged by media. I got besieged by media. I mean, the sick serial killer joke could go a long way. I instantly called the publisher and the editor and said that, please, feel free to distance yourself from me. I'm sure, you know. They said, are you kidding? This genre magazine has never had this kind of press. Will you do a monthly column for us? <laughs> um, so it was after I did several of those columns that I uh, uh, got interest from Random House and then Penguin and finally Simon & Schuster, where I ended up uh, doing my book with. Um, and it's uh, got gay themes all throughout the book, uh, but it's also about a lot of the escapades, which I found myself in as an animal activist going back to uh, the 70s, in fact. There's a lot of costumes in the book. I dressed as a priest to sneak into a fur fashion show in Milan with a Thou Shalt Not Kill banner. Uh, I'm dressed up as a, a bunny rabbit, a rat, you name it. And the book opens actually uh, with a Midwestern escapade in which I actually dress as a carrot to promote vegetarianism outside of beef felt elementary schools. And I'm gonna read you just a little bit from that uh, prologue. It's called Meet Me in St. Louis, only meat is spelled a little bit differently. <clears throat> the hefty woman at the night desk of the sleep in in Omaha greeted us with maps, brochures, and directions to the ice machine, oblivious to the huge crate we carried past her. She had no idea that it contained the lifeless orange body of a creature, half man and half vegetable, whose arrival in Nebraska was receiving the sort of welcome Charles Manson gets at a parole hearing. Safely inside our $39 hideout, we bolted the door, flounced onto the polyester bedspreads, and turned on the late news just in time to see school officials pondering their most challenging task of the semester. How to keep a crusading carrot away from impressionable elementary school students. <laughs> Kids shouldn't talk to strangers, a concerned mother told the reporter on TV, even if that stranger's a vegetable. <laughs> Welcome to the inaugural tour of vegetarian mascot Crispy Carrot. With my feet in his clunky white shoes, Mr. Carrot stands over seven feet tall, with bright, cartoon-like eyes, 
a fountain of greenery sprouting from his head, and a wide smile made of dark mesh through which whoever is inside can see out. He holds a poster that reads, Eat your veggies, not your friends. We thought of going with Eat Me, but thought again. <laughs> Completing the ensemble is a pair of fluorescent orange pantyhose, which sadly wouldn't stretch to the top of my lanky legs. I found myself holding the sign with one hand and constantly yanking up the glowing tights with the other. As PETA's campaign's chief, I don't ask anybody to do anything I wouldn't do myself. And since I had cooked up this junket, it was my duty to give the flame-colored mascot a test ride in order to work out the kinks for future carrots. My comrade was recently hired campaigner Tracy Ryman, a chipper gal from Georgia who I was training. On her very first business trip, she had to rise at dawn to help her new boss morph into a reject from the land of HR puff and stuff. <laughs> Tracy also became the carrot's official spokesperson because the voice I had developed for Crispy Carrot, a hybrid of John Wayne and Pee Wee Herman, triggered panic-stricken shrieks and projectile tears from second graders.